Okay, so medication confusion. That's one of the main reasons for people being poisoned. It is difficult um, to remember all the different pills. I mean, Ashley alluded to the number of pills that people are taking, um, and I'm going to add on to that as well. So 90% take at least one drug. 12% take 10 or more drugs. Women typically take more drugs than men. Care home residents take seven to eight drugs on a regular basis. And they also, in addition, take a lot of non-prescription medication. So you are talking an awful lot of tablets you're trying to juggle. My husband and I decided we thought it would be a good idea to try and remember to take an aspirin every night. Could we remember it? So that's us trying to take one and remind each other. So it is difficult. So, no, so consequently, up to half of over 65s don't take the drugs as they, are as they should do. And that goes right across the population. There are a hell of a lot of prescriptions that are out there that people get that are just wasted. People don't take the medication as they should do. And older people are more susceptible to the effects, and I'll explain why in a minute. And there was a study in Spain that said that if you are taking more than six medicines, you're three times more likely to die prematurely. And again, I will explain why, because they will interact together and mistakes and complications will happen. And even up to five medicines a day, there is an increased risk. So apologies to any of you that are taking more medicines. Sit there and stay safe. But hopefully as we go through, you'll realize that maybe some of those medicines might not be necessary. So perhaps a chat with your GP might not, well, they might be necessary, but they might not. So let's go through. So there's my mother. Um, at the age of two, she was prescribed opium for her asthma. She went on to live to 93, but throughout her life, she had various autoimmune diseases. And all the time I was growing up, she was on you know, a fair bundle of med medicines for all sorts of things. She was on long-term steroids for a long time <coughs> until she got Alzheimer's. When she got Alzheimer's, all her medication stopped. And she was actually, apart from not being quite there, up there, she was actually as fit and healthy as you, yeah, without the medicines. I have no idea how that's happened. I would love to discuss with someone whether there's any connection, but I thought it was very interesting that forever she'd been on those, that medication and then she wasn't. So as people get older, the amount of water in the body decreases, the amount of fat tissue increases. This is a generalization, but it's generally true. The amount of water decreases because the kidneys are not as effective as co at concentrating the urine as they once were. And um, you wee more. <laughs> and um, you may not drink as much. Older people don't tend to have that initiation that they, they're thirsty. It, it diminishes. And also, you may not want to drink as much if you're going to have to run to the loo. So it's a uh, 22. That means that drugs that dissolve in water reach higher concentrations. So people on digoxin, for example, might need a lower dose. Drugs that dissolve in fat um, accumulate because there's more fat to store them. They hang around. Your kidneys can't excrete and get rid of your drugs from your system as well as they once could. And your liver doesn't break them down as well. People who take more drugs have a higher risk of the drugs in their system interacting. And there are very few studies that actually work out how much of the drug an older person should take. It's horrendous. <laughs> so they're mostly done in the main population. It's the same in very small children as well. It's a bit of a guesstimate. And the pharmacists that I've been talking to have said that very often they've got people that come into the pharmacy 
to collect their medication and their medication has been changed, it's been reduced. And they get very angry about it because they have been taking the same tablets all the way through and suddenly that little white one's gone. <laughs> and that little white one was a really important one to them. And the older people themselves do not understand that actually their metabolism may mean that they need less. So instead of having three little white ones, they've now got two little white ones. And it's an added confusion and they feel like they've lost control. So it's about understanding that as well. It's not as simple as we would like it to be. Ashley referred to this earlier. Medication increases the risk of falls. It does for all different reasons, particularly your blood pressure um, lowering tablets. If you get up too fast and you've taken your blood pressure reducing tablets, you can find that you get very dizzy quite quickly and that can be a cause of falls. Also, a lot of medication can cause confusion and dizziness and affect your balance and make you sleepy and none of it helps. So they may be on multiple medicines, they may have an increased risk of drug interactions and mix-ups. And going back to my mother when she was on her um, bucket loads of medication before she got further on in her Alzheimer's, when she was just muddled with it, she was making herself really ill taking all these tablets goodness knows when. And we ended up having to pay somebody to go in to give her her tablets. And she was so much better when she was actually getting the tablets she was supposed to get at the time she was supposed to get them um, and less confused by that. So again, it's, it's difficult. Um, we've talked about less effective at metabolising, age-related changes that affect your drug concentration and increased sensitivity to medicines. So they will, older people will react more to the medicines in your system and the confusion. Uh, in addition to this, you have multiple different specialists. Going with my mother-in-law to go and see she's lost her balance and we've been referred to the orthopaedic surgeon, is it spinal? To the neurologist, is it to do with her ear? And it's only now that she's been referred to a geriatrician who has a holistic view and is looking all the way through. And before, when we were going, each time we went to a different specialist, they were there offering us different drugs for whatever it might be. And we actually need someone to say, hold on a minute, this is one person with a whole set of problems, let's look at that person and let's see how we can help them in one proper <laughs> view. <laughs> um, in addition, you've got impaired memory, which I think starts pretty young. Um, trying to remember those wretched pills. Uh, it might be harder to open the bottles. Um, mobility, uh, diuretics, they can be a real problem for older people. And very often they're ones that people will miss out because if you're on a diuretic that's gonna make you wee and you've got a mobility problem and you want to go out and get around, you're going to manage that, irrespective of what it says on the bottle, around your life. And that's important. And if that is causing a problem, then they should speak to their GP or to the pharmacist and see if there is an alternative solution. Because if they're on diuretics, there's a reason for them. They may have you know, congestive cardiac failure and have water accumulating in their legs and you don't want that to happen either with the extra strain on the heart. So there, is, there are reasons for these drugs, please don't cut them all out, but just think about what you're, what you're doing. Difficulty hearing, when they're sitting in front of the doctor they, or, the, or the pharmacist, they may not hear what this drug is for and what, why they should be taking it. And certainly again, my mother-in-law, she just sees that white coat and she'll just do whatever they say and may not question. I mean, she's been prescribed things for, thing, for ailments that actually she hasn't got just because they've suggested it and she's nodded. Bonkers. <laughs> um, and they may also have difficulty swallowing. 
Um, my nephew was saying that his father-in-law, who's got Parkinson's, is really struggling with his tablets. And it's actually taking him about an hour and a half to get the tablets down. And he's got them five times a day. So when we get onto dosset boxes, which I'll talk about later, they only offer those as four times a day, a lot of them, which means that, that it doesn't fit in with what they're doing. So it's actually putting a, an incredible strain on the family, trying to get the medication to the person because you're trying to do your best for them, but actually the medication they've been prescribed is not working with the lifestyle. There are other options very often. There is a once a day option, um, a different formulation. So ask your pharmacist, they should be able to help. Never ever stop medication, any medication, without talking to your doctor first. But in particular, beta blockers, benzodiazepines, antidepressants, steroids and warfarin will cause you harm if you stop them like that. They need to be titrated down slowly and steadily. So tips to avoid medication problems. Be actively involved. Don't be like my mother-in-law and just nod because someone in a white coat's giving you medication. Ask, what's it for? What does it do? Have I got that problem? And if it's an older person going along or anyone going to your doctors, you won't take in everything that they're saying. So take somebody with you. Ask the doctor to write down what they're saying. So if somebody can't come with you, they can at least show it to the person after and then they can sit there and say, yes, they've prescribed this because, and that's why, because you won't remember. Um, have a medication list with you at all times. You never know when you might have an accident. And read the patient information lists uh, and sheets. I know they are really small. They are available. You can get large, large um, print ones of them, and the chemist can give you larger print ones of them as well. And the drug company has loads of information on them. Yes, you have to ask, yes, it's a pain, but it's your health and, and you know, your life or your parents' health or whoever's health, it's important. And be aware of dietary and medication interactions, and that goes for alcohol as well. Some of them will make you really ill if you with, um, take them with alcohol. And some of them interfere with an awful lot, or some of your day-to-day -day foods interfere with them uh, a lot. And we'll get onto that later. Um, always take medication exactly as prescribed. If it's prescribed to be on an empty stomach, that's because it needs to be on an empty stomach in order to be absorbed the best, to give you the best drug. If it says eat with food, it's because that is what is best for the drug in order to transport it. If it says spray it under your tongue, it's because that is the fastest way to get it into your bloodstream. There is a reason as to why it tells you. And if whatever it tells you is not easy for you to do, then tell the pharmacist, I can't do that. Is there an alternative way? And your pharmacist really should be there to help. And I was chatting to them in Boots and they were saying not enough people do come in and, and ask them. And people don't think to ask the pharmacist, they go back to the GP. The GP, when they prescribe, most often they will be checking it on the computer. <laughs> they are not experts in pharmacology. That's not what they've done their degree in. They are experts in the looking after you and what your ailment is. They don't necessarily know what interacts with what. The pharmacist has done their degree in just that. So get them to help you and they will link up with the GP and they should be able to help too. Okay, your medication list should have exactly what you're taking, including anything you pick up when you're in the chemist. So anything over the counter, because it might affect the other stuff you're taking. Who prescribed it and why did they prescribe it? Special directions, any monitoring, things like warfarin, what need monitoring? Any previous adverse reactions you've had, what to do if you miss a dose, and why you've got that medication. 
And if you've stopped the problem that you had that medication for, you go back to your GP and say, I'm not suffering from that anymore. Is it because this pill has cured me or do I no longer need the pill? How often, what dose, and make sure you're checking the expiry dates too. Um, anticholinergic drugs. You may have heard of this, I don't know, but a lot of drugs have anticholinergic side effects and they're common drugs. So things like flu remedies, ordinary cold remedies, um, allergy drugs, um, antidepressants, antihistamines. They very often have these side effects and they block this vital acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, which allows your cells to talk to each other. As we get older, we have less of this in our system. So if you have got people got a drug that is then blocking what you haven't got a lot of, it's going to make you feel rotten and sluggish. It is vital for memory, learning, concentration, and it also enables your heart, your blood vessels, your airway, your urinary tract, and your digestive organs to function. So it's pretty vital stuff. And the side effects if you're on um, anticholinergic drugs are confusion, blurred vision, constipation, dry mouth, lightheadedness, loss of balance, and difficulty starting to weigh. And all those sort of things can then make it even more likely that you're going to fall. So like Ashley was talking about, medications can make you more prone to fall as well. And the reduction of acetylcholine is also implicated in dementia. So be aware of this. If somebody has started taking antihistamines in hay fever season and they are suddenly a bit foggy and not quite with it, it may be the side effects. Um, sometimes people use these drugs precisely because of their side effects, such as with Parkinson's. They're very good at reducing the tremor, and that's what they're prescribed for. But if they're on Parkinson's drugs with the anticholinergic, you may well find that they are, again, not as sparky as they once were. So these drugs are great, but they also have risks. Um, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but when I was nursing, everyone used to have something for their bowels as we went round on the drug trolley. <laughs> they used to have some sort of sleeping pills. It was routine. When the doctor came in, they wrote you up for it. Um, and people used to turn to these. They also had a little tot of, tot of Guinness as well that we used to give them. We were very nice in those days. Oh. And the health service budget was probably a little bigger. So. Anyway, that's what we were doing. Explore alternatives first. There are always alternatives to these sort of drugs and the drug should be the last resort. So there's all sorts of things. I'm not going to go into that now, but you know, like your milky drink and you know, if you're having, to, having urinary problems, don't drink anything too late at night. All those different things, your routine, I can go into later, but I'm not going to go in now. And diuretics, we've already mentioned, they can be a pain. Right, question for you. Who knows what's on a lot of people's breakfast tables that can cause really serious interactions with the drugs that you might be taking? Absolutely. Did everybody know that? Oh, I'll go home then. <laughs> no? Thank you. <laughs> so, a lot of drugs say on them, do not eat grapefruit or drink grapefruit juice at any time whilst taking this medication. Okay? It is a known interaction, but quite often people don't realise. So grapefruit has these things in there called phoranocoumarins, and a single glass of juice can reduce the production of these really important enzymes that will break down the drugs by 47%. So one glass can mean that um, your drugs are not going to be broken down properly, which means the drug will still hang around in your blood and this dose will accumulate and it can cause 
really major side effects if you're susceptible. Not everybody um, is as susceptible, so some people will be fine. We have different levels of this, um, these enzymes in our bodies, so not everyone is affected and not all the drugs are affected. But it can be very serious and it can be fatal. <coughs> so things like statin drugs, not all the statins are affected, <coughs> but some are. And statins, if you are affected, they can have really nasty effects on your liver and on your kidneys. And this additional dose can lead to liver damage and it can prove fatal. <coughs> Viagra is on there too. <coughs> there have been cases when the potency of the Viagra has been so increased that A, it's very uncomfortable and B, it can lead them to losing consciousness, which isn't desperately effective for anyone. So, you know, be careful with these, these drugs and this interaction. It's, it's, it's serious. Bless him. <laughs> the other thing that grapefruit juice can do is it can decrease the amount of drug in the bloodstream. It depends on the drug. It depends how it's working. So if you're on a drug like fexafenadine, which is a common antihistamine, what that does is it actually blocks these very clever little drug transporters that allows the drug to be absorbed. So consequently, you might be having your fexafenadine because you're getting a bit snuffly for hay fever, and you're taking it with a lovely glass of orange juice in the morning, and that orange juice is countering the whole effect of your medication. So fexafenadine links with grapefruit, orange, and apple juice. So if you're not reading that tiny, tiny little print on there when you are going through, you may find that you're popping those tablets and not getting any sensible effect. So that is what your grapefruit or your orange juice can do. So just be aware. Leave it as long as possible. They will tell, get the fun, avoid grapefruit if you're on that. I'm going to take um, questions at the end if that's all right. Completely. It completely. Cut out your grapefruit if you're on one of those affected would be my, okay. there's other alternatives. And cranberry juice does much the same with warfarin. Although in America, the drug company has persuaded them that it doesn't really. But in the UK, it's down in the British National Formula as a serious interaction. Um, so if you're on warfarin, you should avoid cranberry juice. OK, swallowing problems we mentioned earlier. There's usually a liquid alternative, a once a day, a lower dose. And ask the question, do they really need it? Yes, they might, but ask it anyway. And your first aid if there's been an overdose, is can I go back after, or do you want to? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, no, it's good. It's fine. So, first aid for an accidental overdose: establish what's been taken. 111 or the poisons database can give you advice. So get hold of the pot, see what's missing, and get um, advice on it. Never make anyone sick. This is the same if it's an adult or a child that has done an accidental overdose. Encourage them to stay still, because if they are moving around a lot, they will metabolize it faster. And you don't want them to metabolize it faster, because you want to get the emergency services to, to check out. Call an ambulance if there's anything not right and if they seem absolutely fine take the advice from 111 and if they say drive them into hospital then that's fine too but take advice if they're behaving strangely you do not want to start driving and find that they've started having a seizure in the car or they've collapsed further because that will be much harder for anyone to manage and if they're unconscious you obviously need to check if they're breathing or not breathing and put them in the recovery position or do CPR depending Okay, these can be helpful. 
So these, here we go, Dosset boxes. Have you seen them? Yeah. yeah? Check them. Again, my nephew, when he was um, talking about the, the issues that he's had with his father-in-law, he said sometimes, yes, they have been filled by the pharmacist, but sometimes they're not quite right. So please check them before, th before they're given. They can be really helpful to be filled up and, and checked through. Um, make sure that you use things like apps and alarms to notify you what time you should do there, you should do that and have the, the medication. And there's things like Siri and Alexa that are now being used far more in the care of older people to alert people um, when something's not quite right. Um, uh, I was reading something last night all about that sort of technology and how helpful it can be with um, dementia when you can actually ask someone something, a question and get a sensible answer be it what time it is, what's, what's happening, what's on the telly, but just have some communication on that. And you can also use that sort of technology to help with tablets and medication. In addition, you've got that on the top right, you've got similar things like that, which are linked to the carer's phone, and they will alert them if the person has not taken all their medication, or they haven't taken it on time, or something's not quite right. So they will actually help you to remotely care for whoever you're caring for. So there are things coming that can help. Not to do with, um, with medication, but there's also something called three rings. I don't know if you've come across that, where you can have a special plug that you can plug in, for example, by the kettle. So if somebody hasn't made their cup of tea, by their usual time for making their cup of tea, it will alert you that maybe there's something not quite right. So there's in increasing things that are happening to help people um, to look after other people and keep a little bit more of an eye um, remotely. And the pot in the fridge, which I haven't fished out, but does everyone know what I mean by the pot in the fridge? I think I've left it down there. A little white pot with a green label on, and it's got a green lid. I think it's at the back, so don't worry, Carolyn. I'll, I'll show you later if you want. So it's a little pot, and what you do is you write your medication and all your details in it, and you put it in that pot, and you put it in the front part of the fridge. And if you have an accident and the emergency <coughs> services come, they know that that is what they have to look for. So it's a really helpful thing. So as I say, I've got one at the back of the room that I can show you after.